graduating class, distinguished faculty, parents, families, board of directors, staff, friends, and supporters, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 commencement of the Colburn School's Conservatory of Music. Today is a day, despite the distance, for us to collectively celebrate each of you and your accomplishments and to wish you well as you enter the next chapter of your lives. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our commencement speaker, Rena Esmail, and to our board chairman, Andrew Milstein. Finally, my heartfelt appreciation to Mark Lawrence for his teaching artistry and his many contributions to the growth and development of the conservatory. Congratulations, Mark, on receiving an honorary doctorate today and joining the ranks of faculty emeritus. As we begin our virtual ceremony, we must and should acknowledge the world outside of Colburn, and in particular, the pain, suffering, and outrage in black communities across this nation and right here in the city of Los Angeles. The brutal killing of George Floyd and others in recent weeks has galvanized the world and forced all of us to confront the oppression, violence, and injustice that African Americans in this country have endured for four centuries. Each of us is searching for how we can best lend our voices and our talents to finally affect lasting change and create a more tolerant and just society. I want you to be the first to know that in the coming days, the school will announce Colburn's contribution to that effort, a campus-wide initiative reflective of our values and of our strength as a community of performing artists and educators. I look forward to sharing our thoughtfully developed plans with all of you and the rest of the Colburn community very soon. Today, by virtue of the fact that I'm speaking to you remotely, we must also acknowledge the events that led us to close our campus in mid-March and now have caused one of the greatest disruptions in the performing arts that any of us have ever experienced. Orchestras have been silenced, summer festivals canceled, and fall academic semesters put into jeopardy. What does this mean for you, our brilliant young artists and communicators? My colleagues and I remain firmly and enthusiastically optimistic about the future of the art form to which you have dedicated your lives. Already, we are seeing signs that the concert and cultural life is beginning to come to life and reemerge re in parts of the world. While coronavirus has and will continue to create significant challenges for the immediate future, the music you perform, the knowledge you carry, and the artistry and humanity you impart will be even more relevant and more important. As we emerge from this current crisis, audiences and communities will be that much more in need of the shared experience of live performances and the inspiring, healing, and communicative power of your musical artistry. New opportunities will arise and technology will facilitate new ways of reaching audiences, but the essence of what you do will always remain vital to our world. Many of you know that during the COVID pandemic, we have been using the phrase Colburn Connected in posting your performances, sharing news, and keeping in touch with our larger community. But Colburn Connected is much more than a social media hashtag. Colburn Connected is the mantra for our close-knit and supportive community. I ask and encourage you to remain Colburn Connected as graduates, connected to your colleagues and fellow alumni, connected to your exceptional faculty mentors, connected to your communities, connected to all of us here at Colburn. We exist as a conservatory to develop and guide the next generation of classical musicians. And I want to thank all of those who supported your journey here at Colburn, from our distinguished faculty and dedicated staff to our board of directors and generous donor community. I also want to acknowledge the hard work and commitment of the staff who spent tireless hours crafting today's commencement event. And now, as you join the small and amazingly successful group of Colburn alumni that have come before you, please know that our responsibility to you does not end with your graduation today. Remain Colburn connected. We are all here to support you in the months and years ahead. Congratulations, class of 2020. We so look forward to welcome you back to campus so that we can celebrate you in person. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Colburn Conservatory Dean, Lee Chiopa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you around the world today. 
I am Lee Chopa, the Dean of the Colburn Conservatory of Music. I would like to extend my warmest welcome to the class of 2020, families, friends, members of our board of directors, faculty, staff, and other students who are joining us virtually for the graduation ceremony of the class of 2020. Weeks ago, when we were all separated in March, I'm sure we all thought about whether it would be possible to share a proper goodbye or a proper celebration of all of you at commencement. In the intervening time, we've certainly all learned about what we can and cannot do. And it's been amazing that it's been mostly about what we can still accomplish despite distance and time zones and internet connections. So here we are. And you're watching me in a video on Zoom, and it certainly can't be how you imagined this day would happen. No lovely breakfast, no walking across the zipper stage. But no distance will erase this day, or the years of accomplishment and friendship and memories. There's an interesting fact about the brain and human memory. We are hardwired to remember negative experience. It's the negative things that were the threats to the survival of our ancestors, that tiger that nearly killed you or the river that nearly drowned you. Those negative memories are stored more deeply than the positive ones as warnings, once burned, twice shy, as the saying goes. So here's the thing about this commencement. We are in a pandemic. You all had to move out of the residence hall in the middle of the semester, switch to taking your lessons and classes online, and so many things that you planned and hoped for were canceled. Negative, right? But you won't forget it. And you won't forget each and every person that was a part of that collective experience. You will have memories that weren't all bad because this community stepped up and supported each other in incredibly generous ways. And we all saw so clearly into each other's truest, kindest selves. You will look back someday and say, wow, I definitely remember my last year at Colburn. There was this pandemic and my commencement was on Zoom. We at the Colburn School, the faculty, the staff, your fellow students, we will always remember this commencement too. We are all so proud of you, our newest alumni. And though you may be embarking into truly what may seem like a new world, carry with you the knowledge that there will always be people at Colburn who are cheering you on and who hope that we had some small part in giving you the courage and resilience to create for yourself a meaningful and fulfilling life wherever this wild adventure may lead. It is now my great pleasure to introduce two of these new alumni. Today's student speakers were nominated by their fellow graduating classmates to speak at this ceremony. Connor Rowe, graduating today with the Bachelor of Music in Trombone, is a student of Mark Lawrence. He will speak first, followed by Liam Brawley. Liam is graduating with the Artist Diploma in Viola and is a student of Paul Coletti. I give you Connor Rowe and Liam Brawley. Thank you, Dean Chopa. And thank you, Class of 2020, for the privilege of letting me speak today. I come from a small town. My high school marching band had fewer than 50 kids, and almost no one took private music lessons. Before I came to Colburn, I was a whale in a bathtub. I had already won an international competition and participated in two prestigious summer festivals. I was accepted to every school I auditioned at, including Curtis and Juilliard. The occasional defeats I suffered only motivated me more to convince the world of my invincible trombone skill. Then, in my first year at Colburn, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, my dream orchestra, announced an opening and my Disney Hall-sized ego got busy planning my life as an LA film musician. By the time the audition came around in May, I was dimly aware that I was facing a new level of competition. At Colburn, Everyone was so serious, so skilled, and so much more experienced than me. I had to push myself harder than ever before just to keep up. Still, I knew I had what it took to beat the odds, and I diligently prepared for the audition, ready to become the youngest musician ever to win a spot in the LA Phil. I auditioned twice, but never got past the first round. My blimp-like ego, which flew me above the competition in high school, was shredded. I had no purpose now that my dream job was filled, 
and the sparkly future that called me into the practice room every day was gone. Fortunately, I did not have to survive this rude awakening alone. At Colburn, I was surrounded by classmates who had similar hopes and dreams. Our freshman year, we clung to each other, sharing a mix of fear and excitement as we were exposed to the vast world of music away from home, many of us for the first time. Through our many class outings for ramen or brunch, late night talks on the sixth floor couches, and our shared misery in piano class, we forged fierce friendships. As we got closer, I began to see aspects of myself reflected in each of you. Although between us, we represent nine different countries and widely different cultures and communities, we are all united in our drive to find and express our voices and in our shared love of creating beauty through sound. I took comfort in knowing that I was not alone in my struggle to find my voice. After my first year, I began to notice a change within myself. My dream grew from which job where to what community and how would I fit in? Dreams change. They have to. Sometimes the world changes them for you. Sometimes you change them yourself. But most of the time, it's something in the middle. A tug of war with the reality of today and the imagined futures of tomorrow. We all came to Colburn with a dream of some kind. And for a few of us, Colburn has guided us swiftly toward those dreams. For most of us, the bumps and bruises we've endured along the way have tempered our dreams, pruning some and evolving others into something richer. Today, as circumstances force me to appear to you as a face on a screen, we can appreciate more deeply than ever how the world can affect our dreams. We all had high hopes for our last months as students at Colburn. Culminating recitals and performances, ping pong games, beach trips, and shared meals. While we lost valuable opportunities to make memories, many others have lost so much more. My teacher, Mark Lawrence, speaks often about the mental toughness required to nail an audition. As we shelter at home, that mental toughness is required of us each day as we strive to improve ourselves without the opportunity to connect with a live audience. We must now adapt to a world without the physical presence of our friends and teachers some of us are even yearning for the days when we could practice uninterrupted for hours without disturbing neighbors or family members. But now is not the time to lose focus. As musicians, we are uniquely qualified to deal with the quarantine. After all, we're used to spending hours alone in practice rooms each day. The current crisis requires us to be creative in how we connect with each other and new audiences, and I am heartened by the connection I still feel with each of you. I've seen you all display incredible dedication and tenacity in pursuit of your artistic goals. You have the grit to overcome injury, the perseverance to face the rejection of committee after committee with stronger resolve, the dedication to combat personal demons and self-doubt, and the wisdom to accept that progress requires patience. It was your kind words and smiling faces that supported me after what I felt to be a lackluster performance convincing me to carry on. Now it is because of you that I return to my practice space, whether it be one of those green and white rooms, a bedroom, or a parking garage. Even though we will no longer share a dormitory together, our shared memories and the wisdom and support we have given one another will remain with us throughout our lives. That being said, none of us got here today by ourselves. With the help of our Colburn community, we learned to be innovators, both on stage and in the practice room. Colburn privileges us in a way few other institutions can. We have a legion, hundreds strong of people in the building, rooting for us every day, selflessly providing the support we need to find and strengthen our voices. And when one of us wins, it's a win for everyone. We have our donors, without whose generous and ardent support the Colburn community would not exist. There are those we forged lifelong relationships with, our teachers, who heard the potential of our voices and have patiently cultivated us to more effectively communicate with our instruments. A team of administrators who time and again show us grace as we grapple with the unforgiving world of paper and deadlines. Academic teachers who engaged us with ideas beyond the world of music 
and our Res Life staff and wellness staff who strive each day to ensure our health and happiness. We have a community and career development department who have given us the tools to master everyday life and showed us that the most appreciative audiences are sometimes those who have never set foot in a concert hall. We need our financial office who keep the lights on and the water running, our production team who literally set us up for success in every rehearsal and performance, and our orchestra manager and librarians who make sure we are all in our seats with all the music we need. Our audiovisual team who in addition to making this production possible provide us with world-class recordings so our efforts in the concert hall can be saved for the future. Maintaining our daily lives are our engineers, always at the ready to save us from a rogue elevator, our cafe staff who work tirelessly to keep us happily fed, our friendly security team who let us back into our practice rooms whenever we lock ourselves out, and our janitors who ensure every day that Colburn sparkles like the jewel it is meant to be, despite the fact that we don't always make their jobs so easy. Most importantly, we have our families who have allowed our talents to flourish and instilled within us the tools we need to pursue our dreams. Everyone has played a part in our being here today, and no part was insignificant. Colburn has taught us that music is about community. We learned that the strength of such a community lies not in the sweeping acts of its leaders, but in the kindness, openness, and commitment of all of its members. I hope that you will spread the warmth of the Colburn, Colburn community wherever you go. As classical musicians, we carry with us knowledge acquired over the course of hundreds of years. We are the living museums for music that would have died with its creators if it weren't for our passion and the passion instilled in us by our families and our teachers and each other. As author illustrator Stephen McCraney said, the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. No matter the future challenges imposed on our dreams, sometimes by the world and sometimes by our own mistakes, we will always have each other for inspiration and support. The fires of friendship we lit together during those class dinners our freshman year will burn for the rest of our lives. Beyond your formidable skills as instrumentalists, you are already great teachers, excellent communicators, born comedians, fashion icons, and bold adventurers. These inextinguishable qualities of greatness you bring to your music making and into the world at large, and it is these qualities that give me the most hope for the future of music and the future of humanity. The world on the other side of the pandemic will look different. It is up to us to ensure that our art has a place in it. As we move beyond the halls of Colburn, it is up to us to look out for each other and our communities. It is up to us to make the world better to remember and remind each other that the sounds we make have meaning. I've seen you all do that at Colburn, so I know you can. I'm so proud to call myself a member of the Colburn class of 2020. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you, President Cardan, Dean Chopa, and congratulations to Connor for what I'm sure was a fantastic speech. For obvious reasons, this is not being live streamed, which will come as a huge relief to my high school English teacher. It's a great privilege to have been chosen as the graduate speaker for the Colburn class of 2020, and I'm delighted to be able to share it with you from here within my California retreat. If someone had told me in April of 2017 that three years and one month later, I would not only be graduating with an artist diploma from the best performing arts institution in the world, but that I would also be afforded the honour of addressing its prestigious faculty, staff and fellow students. My response would have been, aye, that sounds about right. But truthfully, my terribly fragile ego would have most likely completely dismissed the notion. However, after taking myself on a spur of the moment trip to Los Angeles and spending a precious sun-drenched afternoon nervously playing for professors at both USC and Colburn, this story began to come to fruition. A few days later, on arriving at the greatest cultural space California has to offer, Disneyland, with the sun shining, the smell of anticipation and overpriced hot dogs in the air, my phone rang. It was Lauren Woodward who had called to inform me that Paul Coletti had asked that I audition for a place in his viola studio and could I come tomorrow? 
Well, as you can imagine, I was faced with a bit of a conundrum. Jump at this incredible once in a lifetime opportunity to join a world class studio and learn from someone I had deeply admired from a young age or explore the happiest place on earth. It turned out to be an easy decision. Luckily, the faculty were able to see me a week later on the morning of my departure, and the rest, as they say, is history. So here I am, fulfilling a lifelong dream as part of the graduating class of 2020. Throughout our collective years at Colburn, we've had many wonderful opportunities, performing alongside internationally recognised artists and conductors, most of whom turned up on time, and we've had successes both on and off campus. For some, this has meant competition wins. For others, job success. And for me, it meant having an argument with a robot. The moment that truly captured the zeitgeist of this graduating class, however, was the Colburn Orchestra tour to Edinburgh and Dublin. There was general excitement around visiting both cities. Edinburgh, world famous as the birthplace of the electric toaster, the S-Bend flushing toilet, and Paul Coletti. And Dublin, for the hypodermic needle, Guinness, and Adrian Daly. This was a true coming together for both orchestra and staff, united in the delights on offer in both historic cities. In Edinburgh, we enjoyed the transitions of Gothic to modernist architecture and were captivated by the acoustics of the Usher Hall. And in Dublin, Guinness, silent discos, and more Guinness. Since arriving at Colburn, each one of us has travelled a unique and very personal journey, as do many during such a transitional phase in their lives. But the difference between ourselves and other graduating classes around the world is that we have been through this together. We have practised together until the small hours of the morning, eaten far too many Colburn burgers, and screamed the house down in pursuit of the all-important Mario Kart win. Living as part of this small community, despite being somewhat on top of one another, has led to much deeper and more lasting relationships than one would hope to find at another conservatory. Of course, had I not been so atrocious at music theory, not, may I add, for lack of trying, I would have graduated a year earlier when the world was in a state of relative normality and I wasn't afraid of the Uber Eats guy touching my box of delicious, crispy nugs. My only worries would have been the two blonde bombshells, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, what to watch next on Disney+, Plus, and my own impending obesity. This year, however, this graduating class and perhaps those who follow face the possibility of a serious change in the music industry. Life for each one of us has already changed drastically, careering to an uncomfortable stop since the worldwide lockdowns have taken place and along with them, our hopes and expectations for the future. This pandemic has unveiled unquestionable weaknesses in our musical institutions, temporarily steering us away from the great pillars of our art form. After all, there can be no great orchestra without its musicians, no conservatory without its students. And therefore, after the world gets back on its feet, the power and responsibility of change will fall at ours. In the words of Gustav Mahler, Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. The preservation of fire takes three things. Firstly, patience. To keep it burning, a fire needs constant attention. Secondly, care. Add too much and the fire will grow uncontrollable and burn the house down. But left neglected, the fire will go out and leave those who rely on it in the cold. And finally, change. To keep a fire burning, we must add to it regularly. Every musician in the world chose their path when a fire was ignited within them. Whether it was attending their first symphony concert or hearing Luciano Pavarotti sing for the very first time, I like to think that all of us began from a place of purity, devoid of the ego that so often drives us while pursuing a career. The changes that we are seeing in 21st century classical music have been long awaited, we are finally seeing the slow but nevertheless sure acceptance of female composers and conductors. And at the very least, orchestras and conservatories are beginning to adopt a sense of equity in the recruitment processes. Music, after all, is for everyone. 
It guides us in dance, allows us to mourn, to celebrate. It sows scene changes seamlessly and makes our most beloved characters all the more memorable. Music, for many of us, provides the otherwise unfathomable context of our deepest emotions. This is why we continue to travel down such a difficult and uncertain path. Not to appease our fragile, or in some cases, overinflated egos, but to bring beauty, magic, and a deeper meaning to our lives and the lives of others. It is for that reason that each one of us must accept the idea of change with open hearts and minds. From here on, it will be our responsibility to make positive contributions to this great fire of ours. In the concert hall, we will strive for excellence, while never forgetting why we chose this path. We will be more inclusive and accepting than ever before, creating a vast melting pot of cultures to enrich our musical legacy. In our pedagogical pursuits, we will teach not from a position of power, judgment or cynicism, but from a place of understanding, openness and equality. In this sense, we must be selfless when it comes time to help others achieve their dreams. Only these things will help keep our music industry alive. I am full of hope for every member of the graduating class of 2020, and I know that we will see each other again soon. Whether it be at Disneyland or Disney Hall, my time at Colburn has taught me this. It's a small world after all. Thank you and congratulations. Music is what we do and celebrate every day at the Colburn School. And although the how of that has changed tremendously in the past few weeks, the why has not. All of the music that you will hear today has a special significance. The entire brass studio and members of the brass faculty are performing, celebrating the retirement of Mark Lawrence. You will hear a string quartet written by Philip Glass in 1988 during the AIDS epidemic. It is a moving reflection on loss and resilience during another time in our history of great illness. You will also hear a beautiful piece by Tchaikovsky. And although I won't try to pronounce the French, the title translated means a memory of a dear place. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Provost of the Colburn School, and it's my great honor today to introduce to you Mark Lawrence, who is being honored upon his retirement from the Colburn School with the title of Faculty Emeritus and with the school's honorary doctorate. Growing up in Iowa, Mark H. Lawrence started learning the piano at age five with his mother, who was an accomplished pianist and violinist. Later, he switched to violin and then cello, but neither one really appealed to him. Mr. Lawrence came to the trombone through the time-honored path of high school band. And while living in Detroit, he became, at age 16, the youngest musician ever to play in the renowned Detroit Concert Band under the direction of cornet virtuoso Leonard B. Smith. Mr. Lawrence attended the University of Michigan studying pre-law at the urging of his parents who wanted to make sure he had some real career options to fall back on. But he saw his true future soon after and transferred to the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, where he received his Bachelor of Music and Trombone Performance. Hailed as one of the greatest classical trombonists of his generation, Mark Lawrence has had a long and successful career as an orchestral musician, soloist, chamber musician, clinician, and teacher all his life. As a young graduate of the Curtis Institute of Music, he was principal trombonist of the Denver Symphony for one year before he won the appointment as principal trombonist with the San Francisco Symphony at the age of 24, a role in which he served for 34 years, retiring from the orchestra in 2007. In addition to his faculty work at the Colburn School, Mr. Lawrence has served on the faculties of Boston University, Northwestern University, the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, the Tanglewood Institute, Music Academy of the West, and the Rafael Mendez Brass Institute. In those capacities, he has traveled the world performing and giving master classes. As a chamber musician, he has been a member of the world famous and groundbreaking Empire Brass Quintet, the Center City Brass Quintet, the Four of a Kind Trombone Quartet, the Summit Brass Ensemble, and San Francisco's Bay Brass Ensemble. He was a featured soloist with the San Francisco Symphony on many occasions, and has been a frequent recitalist in this country and abroad. He has also been guest principal trombonist with the New York Philharmonic, the Cleveland Orchestra, and the Los Angeles Philharmonic, 
and has been co-principal trombone with Chicago's Music of the Baroque. He came to the Colburn School the year he retired from the San Francisco Symphony, bringing a career of orchestral and chamber experience to the school and to his students. Teaching has always been a big part of his life, and many of his students have successful orchestral and chamber careers in the US, Europe, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Japan. As a recording artist, his impressive discography includes three solo recordings, 16 chamber music recordings, and over 30 recordings with the San Francisco Symphony, including their Grammy-winning recordings of Mahler Symphonies 3 and 7. He has also performed on many movie and video game soundtracks at George Lucas's Skywalker Ranch in Marin County, California. Mark Lawrence is a gentleman in the true sense of the word and lives life by the highest ethical standards. Anyone who knows Mark has never heard him say a negative word about another person, and his unfailing positive attitude and appreciation for others is evident in everything he does. These qualities have been transferred to his students throughout the years, who are both fine musicians and artists, and also fine human beings who've become leaders in their music community. As an example of Mark's influence, one of his students graduating today, Connor Rowe, will be going to Juilliard next year to study with the great Joe Alessi, principal trombone of the New York Philharmonic. It should perhaps come as no surprise that Mr. Alessi was a student of Mark Lawrence. Mr. Alessi recalls that when Mark Lawrence arrived in his hometown of San Francisco, there was a lot of talk around town about what a great player he was. The young Joe Alessi, by his own admission, learned a great deal from Mark and today values his teaching very much in his own development as a trombonist. I contacted Mr. Alessi, who recalls that when he was young, Mark Lawrence was his role model. There were many occasions where he would attend a San Francisco symphony concert just to listen to his golden tone. Mr. Alessi says, you could always hear Mark, but he always projected in a beautiful and effortless manner. And to this day, I try to emulate his concepts. Our relationship has transitioned from a student-teacher relationship to a very collegial interaction, and most importantly, to being close friends. Also, Mark lived just over the hill from us. One day, he hiked up the hill with his bass trumpet and played some very loud calls from some of the Wagner operas. He said he played these very loudly in order for me to hear him at our house. Mark later asked at the lesson if I'd heard him, and to his great disappointment, I said, no, Mr. Lawrence, I didn't hear you at all. Among his many gifts, Mark has a great sense of humor and always finds ways to make us laugh and gives us some perspective about life. And at Colburn, an indication of just how important studying with Mark is to his students is illustrated by the fact that all three returning trombonists won jobs last year, and two of them turned down those jobs in order to be able to complete their studies with Mark at Colburn. In the words of one of our alum, Mark Lawrence is a delightful and complex person, mentor and friend to all that are lucky enough to know him. He's also been known throughout the years to pull a few practical jokes, especially in his years at the San Francisco Symphony, where his pranks were legendary. Mark's friends and colleagues know him to be somebody who approaches life from cars to wine and everything in between with great style and panache. So much so that he and former Colburn faculty, Dave Crabell, were known to have gone skiing in full concert dress on at least one occasion. In his free time, he loves open water sculling on the San Francisco Bay. And some of you may know that for many years, Mark lived on a lovely houseboat in the Sausalito Bay. Mr. Lawrence's great strength as a trombonist is the simple loveliness of his sound, which comes through beautifully. And his interpretations are supremely rewarding, yet beautifully restrained. He has the ultimate respect of all of us here on the faculty and staff at the Colburn School. And today we recognize your extraordinary achievements, which will long continue through the work of your many successful students over the coming generations. We all truly congratulate you on your wonderful, fruitful, and successful career, and for your contributions to generations of musicians and audiences around the world. The Colburn School is pleased to reaffirm you as faculty emeritus and to award you the degree of Doctor of Musical Arts, honoris causa. Thank you to President Cardan, Provost Daly, Dean Chopa, Colburn faculty, staff, students, and 2020 graduates. This is actually the first time I've worn a suit in a couple months and uh, it feels very strange. 
this all feels very surreal. And I know this is certainly not how we envisioned the end of the school year. I would have loved to be there with you all to celebrate, but we have to deal with what is and adapt to our current reality. I'm extremely honored to be receiving this honorary doctorate from Colburn. I have been very fortunate in my 50 years as a performer and teacher to have had many wonderful experiences and relationships with colleagues and students. And certainly one of the highlights of my career has been having the opportunity to work with the amazing students at Colburn. The talent, energy, and enthusiasm you all have continually amazes and inspires me. During my lifetime, I've had successes, failures, and everything in between. One of the things you learn when you've been doing this as long as I have is that your life's trajectory is very rarely static. There are many days when you feel nothing can go wrong, and there are many days when you feel that nothing can go right. So I think it's important to not get too emotionally bogged down in the natural ups and downs of your daily life. Always keep your focus on the goals you have set for yourselves and realize that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And there will always be normal setbacks and disappointments along the way. I know we are all concerned about what the musical landscape is going to look like on the other side of this pandemic, but nobody has a crystal ball. So since we just don't know what the society will be like, we can look at this event as a bad thing, or we can figure out how to turn a perceived negative into a positive. It's important to remember that any event that happens in our lives is only negative or positive when we put our spin on it. I suggest that you can use this time to do many positive things that will prepare you for the future, whatever that will look like. First of all, try not to worry about things you can't control. That's wasted energy. Instead, focus on things you can control. Feeling a sense of control makes us less anxious. For instance, during this time, you could learn how to organize your lives in a way that will benefit you from this moment on. You could learn how to be better and more efficient practicers. You could learn new repertoire that you've been wanting to tackle. You could continue to record yourselves to simulate performances you are not having and learn how to perform more online with all the wonderful tools that are available now. You could learn how to meditate. You could visualize every day how you want your lives to be. You could keep a diary of how you were feeling during this time. You could get in great physical shape. I'm still working on that one. Um, you could reconnect with important people in your lives. In other words, you can use this time in a positive way and in a way that will make you stronger and better prepared when life starts to get back to normal. I truly believe the arts will survive this. At first, it might look a little different, but human beings need music. It feeds our soul in a way that not many things can. And you are all such talented musicians that the world will need you. The world will need your gift. You will get through this, and you might actually look back on it as a defining moment in your lives. And to the 2020 graduates, you deserve to enjoy and celebrate this important moment. You certainly earned it with your hard work and dedication. Thank you again, and I wish you all great success and happiness in your lives moving forward.
I am deeply honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Rina Ismail. Rina is an extraordinary composer, pianist, and singer whose work has been commissioned by ensembles ranging from the Kronos Quartet to the San Francisco Girls Chorus to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. She was named a 2019 United States Artist Fellow in Music and was the 2019 Grand Prize winner of the SNR Foundation's Washington Award. In 2017-18, she was a Kennedy Center Citizen Artist Fellow, and most recently, she was named the Los Angeles Master Chorale's Swan Family Artist in Residence and Seattle Symphony's Composer in Residence. Rita and I actually first met over a decade and a half ago when she was studying composition at the Juilliard School. She subsequently went on to Yale School of Music for her master's and doctor of musical arts. In December of 2016, I attended the Messiah Project on Skid Row with the Street Symphony. Rena was composer in residence for Street Symphony and had been commissioned to write a choral work for the Urban Voices Project. We found each other afterwards with that same look of amusement on both of our faces. Don't I know you from somewhere? What I remember most about that performance was that I spent most of it trying to hold back tears. The work that she had written was called Take What You Need, and it was a call and response. There was no performer and no audience. Everyone in the room was a musician and invited to sing. Rena didn't actually write that piece in a studio at a piano and then presented it fully formed. She spent time in Skid Row getting to know the individuals who were going to make that music. The work that she wrote was about the value and dignity and humanity that is in all of us. And she wrote that everyone deserves and should ask for what we need. Take courage, take a stand, take joy, take love. And at this time in the world when our country has been set down a path of separation and otherness and dehumanization, Rena's music has reminded me to take hope. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rena Ismail. Hi, graduates. Congratulations on making it to this day. Congratulations on graduating from one of the most rigorous and intense music programs that any young musician could ever go through. To graduate from Colburn, but frankly, even to get into Colburn, you've probably spent your entire life meeting and exceeding every single expectation and achieving at the very, very highest levels. And now, the moment you graduate, it might feel like the rug is being totally pulled out from under you. And in order of magnitude more than it would for any other graduating class in any other year. You played by the rules, and now suddenly it feels like the rules have changed. And I'm not here to convince you that that doesn't totally suck, because it absolutely does. If you're grieving a life you can no longer live, I really want you to take a moment and just grieve it. Acknowledge that loss before you delete that summer festival or that orchestra trial week from your calendar. And just know that you're not alone. Grieve with your peers. Grieve with the very people who are graduating beside you. And then when it feels right, start thinking about the new world that you want to create together. So as a composer, my entire job is creating new worlds. Sometimes they're hybrid worlds between two musical cultures. And sometimes they're worlds that allow people from different communities within the same city to make music together. I love creating worlds where every person is able to use their own unique abilities to show their best self to one another and to engage one another in really meaningful dialogue. So I wasn't always this clear about what I wanted to do. When I graduated with an undergrad from Juilliard 15 years ago, all I knew is that I had to be the best and I had no idea what that meant. So I tried really hard to follow people who I thought were successful and just do whatever they did. And at that moment, I think success just felt like a rushing river. If I continued to follow the current, it seemed like everyone else was following, I would kind of rush towards success. And if I stepped out of the current for just one moment, the boat would just leave me and I'd be left on the shore. That's really how it felt to me at the time. 
And I remember the moment where I had to finally step out onto the shore. I'd been wanting to study Indian classical music for so long, and I'd been too afraid to do it because I knew it would make me different. And I knew it would give me less time to write music for the competitions and the opportunities and the orchestra readings and all those things that young composers do. But the minute I felt that catch in my throat that makes the beginning of a pitch sound characteristically Indian, I knew there was no turning back. So these kinds of things look really brave in the rearview mirror because of course, a decade later, I know exactly how it turned out. But at the time, it was truly terrifying. I wrote music that wasn't suitable for opportunities that young composers have. And by including Indian musicians, you know, musicians from another culture, which is from my culture, I was excluding my own music from the Western classical culture. And it finally hit a fever pitch when a composer I really deeply admired and trusted told me that I should write my opera in English because no one speaks Hindi, which I mean, there are 30 million more native speakers of Hindi than there are of English, but that kind of shows you the way things were at that time. So each time I start to create, I ask myself, what does success look like? I ask this of myself in my composing, but then I also ask that same question to my creative partners, to conductors, to ensembles, orchestras, choirs, communities. Because if someone is pulling together so many resources to ask me to create a work for them, I want to understand ways to measure the success of that work. And those metrics can be so wide ranging. You know, sometimes it's about bringing in new audiences. Sometimes it's so that a musician can expand their view into a different musical culture. Sometimes it's about ticket sales or donors or publicity or grants. And sometimes it's just that a single person is moved in ways that they can't express in words. But I want to understand the entire range of what success means to them, because then I can see where my definition of success aligns with theirs. And then I can create a work that kind of blooms from that shared vision. And when you're asking someone else what success looks like to them, that means that you can also tell them what it looks like to you in all those same metrics. Because the agreement goes two ways, right? When you know you will bear your soul to a project, it's important for you to ask for what you need in order to bear your soul. And when you know that your work is contributing positively to an institution, you become vital to that institution moving forward. You become indispensable. But here's the thing about these huge institutions. They're all really just people. <laughs> You know, major international competitions and these prizes and press outlets that review your work and auditions for orchestras and managers. It feels sometimes like it's this deus ex machina situation where there's some unknown nameless force that just bestows something on you and you don't know how you got it. And it's really terrifying because that means you also don't know when you're going to lose it. But in actual fact, it's not the powers that be that decide these things. They're all just decided by a few individual people in a room, each casting their vote for their personal values and trying to form the world they want to see. And when you create these really deep, meaningful relationships with individual people, when you really share your soul with them, then that becomes the foundation for something beyond any single project or any single institution. So many institutions are falling apart right now, and I know you're scared. And you know what? I am too. But I've realized that so many people I love at those institutions are actually people I met years ago in other capacities, through different institutions, just in other places. And as this world breaks down, and as we rebuild a different musical ecosystem, we have the chance to build something that's even more successful based on our own values. You get to be in that room. You get to vote for your values. You get to play a part in deciding what the future of this field is. And that's a really incredible opportunity. So six years after I had that first catch in my throat that pulled me into the world of Indian classical music, I got a call. 
In that time in between, I had spent a year in India on a Fulbright, kind of filling in the Hindustani side of my musical training, and then coming back to Yale to do a DMA in the Western classical world. And the call was for a dream commission. It was Yale's choir, Juilliard's Baroque Orchestra, and then solo sitar and tabla players from India. It was the convergence of these three worlds that made up the entirety of my musical training. And I had thought all those years ago that I was stepping out of the river and onto the shore and just letting the musical world rush by me. But what I realized was that I was really standing at the confluence of these three rivers, these three different streams that I had pursued independently and that I was now able to finally bring into dialogue with one another. I wish I could see your faces as I talk to you because I wanna look into each of your eyes and tell you that you are so much more powerful than you think you are. When you step out onto the stage, you step into a space of incredible pressure and incredible judgment from critics, from audiences, and often from even from your own teachers and peers. And you take that pressure and you take that judgment and you alchemize it into beauty and grace and transcendence. Remember that music is just the lens through which you see the world. Ask yourself what success looks like. Ask yourself what your own human values are. Ask yourself, as this world falls apart, what is the world you want to see bloom in its place? And then use music as the means and as the method to answer those questions. Let's live into those questions together and let's create the world we want to see. I have the honor of presenting the Colburn Conservatory of Music graduating class of 2020. The students graduating today have successfully completed their various program requirements as established by the faculty, and in so doing, have also contributed to the growth and life of the Colburn School. Candidates for the Bachelor of Music are Nadia Aziz, Sion Choi, Cassie Drake, Bree Fotheringham, Alexander Hobbs, Sunrise Kim, Mark Lilly, Martin Mangrum, Aubrey Oliverson, Connor Rowe, Tianlu Chu, Candidates for the Performance Diploma are Luis Primera Oyaveres. Candidates for the Master of Music are Dante Ascaruns, Yuna Choi, Riley Conley, Christina Matea Saez, Adam Milstein, Joseph Nunez, Stephen Perkins, Benjamin Salomono, Paul Williamson. Sun Yao, Hana Jadan, candidates for the Professional Studies Certificate are Edward Byans, Jonathan Patrick Chapman, Min Hye Choi. 
Luke Fiewiger, Thomas Friedel, Nicholas David Hooks, Jihi Josephine Kim, Yu Chen Arthur Lin, Johanna Novik, Miles Sue, Candidates for the Artist Diploma are Liam Raleigh, Chiho Samuel Chan, Vitor Hugo de Sosa Quindaji, Shusha Hu, Gunyang Kuang, Daewon Kang, Dong Yob Kang, Minji Kim. Yokyung Kim Wei Lu Melissa Tremblay It is my pleasure to introduce the chairman of our board of directors and proud parent of a member of our class of 2020, Andrew Milstein. Hello everyone, I'd like to extend my warmest and heartfelt greetings to all of you. It would be an understatement to say this is an unusual year and a commencement like none of us have ever experienced before. However, despite the challenges, I know that all of you have demonstrated remarkable perseverance and a continued passion for your art over the last few difficult months. And I'd like to extend my thanks for what you all have contributed to the Colburn community and my congratulations for what you've accomplished during your time here. With that, it is now my pleasure and honor to say that by virtue of the power vested in me by the state of California and the board of directors of the Colburn School and on recommendation of the faculty, I hereby confer upon the members of the class of 2020 the Bachelor of Music degree, the Master of Music degree, the Performance Diploma, the Artist Diploma, and Professional Studies Certificate in Music Performance. Congratulations to the class of 2020 and your place as an unbroken link to the past and future of classical music and performing arts, a responsibility that is as important now than ever before. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and once again, my deep congratulations and gratitude to each and every one of the graduates. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are briefly going to have a live gathering on Zoom of all of our graduates, and it is incredibly amazing to see all of your beautiful faces. Uh, to end our ceremony, I would like to invite our graduating class to turn their tassels from the right to the left. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Colburn Conservatory of Music, Class of 2020. Usually there would be an enthusiastic round of applause at this point. 
to end our ceremony, we would also usually have a brass quintet who would perform as our graduates uh, leave the stage. Today, our trombone studio, all of the students of Mark Lawrence, will be closing our ceremony with a performance of Canzon by Samuel Scheidt. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. 